There was a cab driver and a minister that were standing in line to get into heaven. The cab driver approached the gate, and St. Peter greeted him there. He says, welcome. I understand that you were a cab driver. Since I'm in charge of housing, I believe I have found the perfect place for you. See that mansion over the hilltop? It's yours. Now, the minister, overhearing all of this and being next in line, stood a little taller, t chest puffed out just a little bit, thinking, well, if the cab driver got a mansion like that, so imagine what I'm going to get. And so the minister steps up, and St. Peter says, Welcome, I understand that you are a minister. See that shack over there in the valley? That's yours. Now, before the before St. Peter could even get it out of his mouth, the minister grew irate, and he said, I was a minister. I preached the gospel. I helped teach people about God. Why does that bus driver get a mansion while I get a shack? Sadly, Peter responded, well, it seems that when you preached, people slept. But when the cab driver drove, people prayed. Uh, this week, we're concluding our Life on Mission series, and and we're concluding it with the subject of prayer. And you can tell that I'm in a little bit of a different context, a little bit of a different setting here. We had a little faulty equipment. Um, had a little bit of faulty equipment happen within our, our worship center, but this was an important enough sermon uh, to wrap up this series, an important enough topic that we thought we at least wanted to take a few minutes and and, and to still share what we had, had covered in the event that you had, had missed it. Now, people often, like uh, like in a cab case, uh, people oftentimes pray when things are difficult. That Maybe when a, a trial or a, a trying time comes, they'll kind of loft up a prayer to God as a cry for help. And certainly that's a good thing, and I think God wants us to do that. But I also think that God has, a, has an even bigger plan when it comes to prayer within our life. I, I don't think God meant for prayer just to be an emergency line. Though perhaps it's appropriate, and there are times that God will use some difficult situations in our life to draw us to Him um, and, and utilizing prayer. But I also think that God, uh, God has something bigger in mind for prayer. I think He had something more along the lines of, of a lifestyle. The subject of prayer, when we're talking about living a life on mission, it's it's not last. Um, to conclude this series because it's the last priority or it's the least important. Actually, just the opposite. Uh, Tim Harlow made this point really well in his book uh, when he said, now that we know what it takes to live a life on mission, now that we know everything that's going to uh, be a part of that process, um, uh, things like developing relationships with those that don't know Jesus, to connect with them, uh, to serve people in, in a way that shows them that we care about them so that we can do that third step, which is to share the gospel with them because people don't care about what we know until they know how much we care. And then once we've shared the gospel with them and they've received Jesus, then, then, we, then we walk with them as we together grow in our relationship uh, with Jesus. But then it comes to this fifth action step of prayer. Now remember, as a good reminder, these aren't. This isn't a five-step program. It's not a ten-step recovery process or anything like that. This is intended to be just five steps of living a life on mission. It's really who we who we are. Really, this subject of prayer uh, um, is the most important. So that, that's what Tim Arnold had said: is that uh, the subject of prayer he put last for two reasons. One is now we specifically know what to pray for, but also. Uh, second, it's it's a priority that we are left with. It's the last thing that, that he leaves us with within his book and within the series. And he shared a, a, a quite helpful illustration when it comes to how, how prayer works within this process. And he describes it like uh, the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, the Chicago Bulls. Back in 1990, you know, the Chicago Bulls were, were kind of the basketball superpower uh, of the day. And on and, a certain day in 1990, uh, Michael Jordan scored a career high of 69 points in a single game. In the same game, his teammate, Stacy King, uh, played for a total of 17 minutes. He, he missed four shots, and he made one of two free throws for a total of, of one point within the game. And a few days later, a newspaper, um, an interviewer from the newspaper asked Stacy King, so far in his NBA career, 
what was uh, what were some of his favorite memories. And without missing a beat, he said, uh, "I'll never forget the night that Michael Jordan and I together scored seventy points." <laughs> and and I think that's how prayer works, and that's how God works within this process uh, of living a life on mission. The reality is, God scores sixty nine of the seventy points. And all we have to do to score that one point is really just to show up on the court. Now, I, I've got to confess is um, when we look at these different steps of living a life on mission, the idea of prayer and the importance of prayer is it, it, sometimes something that falls by the wayside within my life. I'm kind of a type A personality, which means I like to get in and fix things, do things, control things. Uh, you know, if there's a problem, automatically I'm thinking of how to fix it. My automatic response is not to drop to my knees in prayer. No, it should be. Because our sovereign God is, a, is in control and he longs for all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he wants to answer these prayers and God works through prayer. But John 15, John 15, Jesus tells it's kind of a parable, but it's really more of teaching right before he goes to the cross. And he tells a story about uh, a garden, in essence. And there's a, there's three characters. There's a gardener, there's a vine, and there's the branches. And, uh, it's, Jesus says God is the gardener. And his job is to prune uh, the garden. And, uh, and that Jesus is the vine and that we are the branches. And he gives the job of each one. The, the, the gardener, as I mentioned, his job is to, is to prune the garden. Uh, the job of the vine is to offer the life, is to offer the uh, the power source uh, to go on living to the branches. And the branch has one job. The end result here is that the branch will produce fruit. And so what sometimes we think, people like me think, well, my job is to produce fruit. My job is to, uh, is to do the work and produce these various things. But the reality is we have one main purpose, one main job. And that one main job is to stay attached to the vine, the one that gives the life, because when we receive the life from the one that we're clinging on to, it's in those moments that we are going to, to bear fruit. And when we are living a life on mission, we must remain in the vine. And when we remain in the vine, we are going to live a life on, on mission. This is one of the greatest truths that, that, that I need to be reminded of, and I have been reminded of as we as we've gone through this study of living a life on mission, sometimes I think I know I'm supposed to be like Jesus. I see First John two six. It says, "For anyone who is in Christ, they will walk as Jesus walked." And so I think, okay, how did Jesus walk? I've got to do that. But the reality is, my first priority is to remain in the vine, and then cooperate with the Spirit's work in my life. When we grow in our relationship with God, going back to last week and and we open up our lives, what God wants to do within our lives, then God transforms us into Jesus. We need to call on Him in every other life. Jim Cimbala, who is, uh, who is kind of a, is known for his influence on um, not just his church, but church as a whole, and the importance of prayer, he says this in his book, titled Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. I'll actually quote him a few times. He says, God can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Our weakness, in fact, makes room for his power. See, when you're, when you're kind of like me, when you're type A, when you want to control, when you want to be knowledgeable, and you want to be wise, when you're like me, <laughs> it's in your weakness that you, you, you try to grow yourself stronger. But the reality is it's when we humble ourselves and recognize our weakness that we have a need for God to step in our lives. And it's in that moment, to finish Jim Simbola's quote, prayer is the source of the Christian life. Prayer is the Christian's lifeline. This actually reminds me of when I began in ministry in, in a little rural village in uh, southern Missouri. And uh, we didn't have a youth ministry, but we were starting a Wednesday night youth program. And so on this particular Wednesday, I remember my, um, Sarah, my wife, and I, um, we were just, we, 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 we grabbed hands and, and we began to pray the very first night of youth ministry in this little 
this little teeny tiny town, and you just pray, God, would you just send us six people, send us six students, send us six seventh through twelfth graders that we can pour our lives into, and then we can begin to impact this community. Send us six. Uh, well, it was a shock to us when we had 15, 15 kids show up that night, and then it was uh, when I really stepped back and I looked at the four years we spent at that church. And I, and I just reflect on the roster, and I still have it, the roster that we had with all of the names of the students that we got to interact with throughout those four years. Um, and when we left, that we had 65 active students. They didn't all show up at one time or anything, but 65 students within a year that had been a part of that ministry. And to think that just a few years prior, we were praying for six. Six to 60, in essence. And can I just be honest? I had no business um, being in ministry. To be, I mean, I, I had I had barely been a full time follower of Jesus. I had just begun Bible college. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was in the midst of my weakness that I knew I was inadequate to do what God had called me to do. So I went to the one who had called me to do what I was called to do, and it was Him that began to be at work. Now, I, I'm still that way, and I, and I just got to be honest, as, as I already have been, as, as I read more books and I study more things and I grow more educated and I have more ministry experience, the longer I go, sometimes the more tempted I am to think I can rely on my own wisdom, knowledge, experience, um, education. The reality is, the more I grow in my relationship with Jesus, the more I know I need God's source of power more I know I need to drop to him to be at work within my life and my ministry because it's not my fruit that I'm trying to produce, but it is God's fruit. I mentioned last week um, in our sermon that one of Satan's greatest schemes is to get God's people isolated, to get them off by themselves. And it's there that Satan's like a roaring lion is looking for someone to devour and he can pick off believers by themselves, but I think at the very heart of isolation, of disconnecting from other Christians, is this idea of, of, I can do this by myself. I can do this on my own. I can live my Christian life by myself. And I think the same thing happens when it comes to our ministry, it comes to our Christian walk, and we don't just isolate ourselves from other Christians. We isolate ourselves from God, too, and we actually unplug from our power source and Jesus says, apart from him, we can do nothing. We must remain attached to that vine. Jim Sibola says, the devil is not terribly frightened of our human efforts and credentials. But he knows his kingdom will be damaged when we begin to lift up our hearts to God. Because Satan's already been defeated. The victory's already been won. Death has already been uh, has been defeated. Sin has already been paid for. It has been removed. Satan knows that he has already lost, and he has lost the power of God. But he can still have some battle wins, and he can pick off God's people and convince them that they're okay on their own, and he can get them isolated from each other and from God. We get far too dependent on ourselves. We get far, far too, too dependent on our church leaders. We get far too dependent on our church programs that we actually stop relying on God and we start, start relying on those other things. All those things are good. God ordained church leaders. Church programs are good ways for us to open up to what God wants to teach us and to listen to various teachers and to grow. Certainly those are good things. But if those are what we're relying on alone, we will dry up. We will be, we will be removed and detached from the vine. And as a result, we will not bear fruit. Certainly we should develop plans of action and create pathways for God to work within our life. But without the power of God in prayer, we are powerless. See, God wants to do so much more through us than we even know. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says that God wants to do immeasurably more than what we can ask or imagine. I, that word hit me this past Sunday. It's the word immeasurably. I always want to measure something. I want to be able to see what kind of impact that can have. No, God wants to do immeasurably more. There's no container that can hurt, hold how much God wants to do through you and through our church and through your church. 
There is so much God wants to do through us, but we must rely on him. The main text uh, that I really want to talk about comes actually in two words. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which simply says, pray continually. The 1984 uh, NIV uses three words, pray without ceasing. The whole passage, if we're to look at a couple of the surrounding verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, uh, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray continually. Pray always. When there's something to celebrate in your life, go to God and celebrate. When there's something that you're struggling with within your life, when there's something that hurts or you're mourning, go to God in prayer. But maybe you're asking the question, well, why pray? Why pray? Why, why should I do this? I, I, there's lots of reasons, but let me just give three. One of them you've already mentioned. One is pray because, um, because it's your power source. We've already mentioned Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. He's the one that offers life, and he's the one that produces fruit. When we remain plugged in with our power source, then we bear fruit. Why pray? Because it is our power source. It, uh, it is our pathway of communication with God. Second, why pray? It keeps us in step with God's heart. Ultimately, in this series, we're talking about living a life on mission. The problem with living a life on mission is people. Can, can I just be honest? You know this. I know this. People can be difficult. People can be a pain. People can be irritating. From a human standpoint, all we can sometimes see is people's bad habits, see their poor behavior. All we can see is their annoying demeanor. All we can see is that they pick their nose and eat their boogers. We see all their faults, and that's all that we can see. But when we live a life of continual prayer and we, and we rely on God, we begin to see people the way that God sees them. And the way that God sees people is he sees people as, as people that he loves, as people that he sent his son to die for. He sees people that were created within his image that have maybe grown to become victims of the enemy, of, of, of Satan. But they are all people that he created in his image, and he sent his son to die for them. When we pray continually, we begin to see people the way that God sees them. I remember in a... Um, in a chapel sermon uh, one time uh, at, the, at the Bible college that I went to, that there was a, a college roommate that was giving uh, the sermon. He was talking about how he really just, just did not get along with his, with his roommate. And they began to, to pray together, and their relationship got so much better. And, and in that whole story that he was telling us, he made one, one phrase. He said, it is difficult to hate someone that you're praying for. It is difficult to hate someone that you're praying for. There are times that we keep people kind of at arm's distance because they're different. We don't understand them. We don't know why they act the way that they, they, they do. But when we begin to pray for them, what we do is we give them space within our brain. We give them, we give them some, some mental capacity. We begin to think about them, and we genuinely want what's best for them, which is for all to come to knowledge of the truth, just as God does. And God begins to work in our lives and help us to see them the way that he sees them. When we pray, we get in line with God's heart. Third, why pray? This one maybe has a little less to do with living a life on mission, but we can't talk about prayer not mention this third, third reason to pray. Why pray? Because God cares for you. Maybe as we've gone throughout this Life on Mission series, maybe you've had some struggles. Maybe you're having marital struggles. Maybe uh, maybe you have bad health, or maybe you've got a family member that has um, that, that has cancer, or or there's been a death in the family. Maybe right now you are just covered in burdens. Maybe right now you feel like you're drowning with all the difficulties of the world. What you need to hear is that God cares for you. Why pray? Because God cares for you and about what you're going through. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And Peter says in chapter 5, verse 7, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. 
whatever it is that causes you anxiety. Maybe it's just this idea of living a life on mission. I don't know what it is for you. But cast your anxieties on God because he cares for you. The God of this universe wants to step into your life. The God of this universe who made you and who created you, he cares for you and longs for you to come into communication with him. Now, I want to be honest, prayer is a mystery. I don't understand, and you probably don't understand. Um, there's many people that have written many books that don't understand all the ins and outs of ministry. I don't know all the theological emphasis. I don't know how the system works. I don't know if there's like some red phone line to God somewhere. I don't know if there's a process of uh, prayers go through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus and they go to the Father. I don't know all the ins and outs of prayer. I, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that God works through prayer. And we can know so first because God called us to do so within his word. His word is trustworthy and it is reliable. But also we go to God in prayer and we can know it's reliable because we have experienced that we have seen stories, we've heard stories of so many people all the way throughout history. Let me just share a few, just a few statements from some people. Dave Stone, um, senior minister at uh, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, he said this, I found that when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, they don't happen. And so I'm better off when I invite God into my day and say, Lord, will you lead me to the people you want me to visit with today? Will you find someone for me to encourage? Is there someone that I can pray with? Is there something that I could do on your behalf? And he said, when I begin my day with, with prayer, it's as if God kind of dictates my decisions and directs my steps. When I don't, I feel like I can spin my wheels and don't get as much done on those days. Can you relate to that? God works in so many different ways. Tom Holliday, the teaching pastor at Saddleback in California, he told a story about, uh, about his dad and how he prayed for his dad for 30 years. 30 years he prayed for his dad that he would come to know Jesus. And after 30 years, he did. Similarly, Gene Apple tells a story about a mom that prayed for her son for 40 years. And at the end of that story, the son was baptized into Christ placed her faith in him and began to live for Jesus. And Gene Apple asked a great question. What if she stopped praying? What if this mom stopped praying for her son at 39 years and said, you know, I don't think it's ever going to happen. And Gene says, don't ever underestimate the power of your prayers for someone who has yet to experience the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Don't ever underestimate the power of your prayers for someone who has yet to experience the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Christ. Ian Bounds has said, talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. To which we can say, you have to take the people to God before you take God to the people. You have to take the people to God before you take God to the people. You know, it isn't sometimes until we realize that we're completely in over our head. It isn't until there's, until there's a time we feel like we've done everything that we can do. We've connected, we've served, we've shared, we've done everything we feel like we can do. And it just seems like nothing is happening in the people that we're trying to reach for Jesus. And it's in those moments that we've got to drop to our knees and pray continually. Pray day in, day out. That God would soften their hearts and draw them to him. And there has been story after story, even maybe if it takes 40 years. Maybe today marks the day that you begin praying for someone for 40 years. It'd be worth it, wouldn't it? If you prayed every day for 40 years for someone, only to see them come into a relationship with Jesus at the end. One more passage of scripture. A couple of key phrases that I think really Paul, Paul puts this passage together well and actually represents uh, this whole series really quite thoroughly and really quite well it comes from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, where Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the ways you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. 
Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This passage talks about being watchful. Look for those opportunities to connect. Look for those opportunities to serve. It talks about opening up a door to share. Pray that you may open up, a, that God may open up a door for our message. And there's other phrases in here like make the most of every opportunity. Look for those opportunities. Look to connect. Look to serve. Look to share. Look to grow alongside people. Look for those various opportunities. But it starts with the first four words. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Then look. Because God is looking to answer those prayers. God longs for all of his children to come home. Every soul is or has once been a lost child that God longs to bring home. So maybe just a few practical tools here. If you if you don't really have an active prayer life or uh, it's not a habit that you have started, it's not something that you naturally begin to do, maybe you're like me. Here are just a few little little ones. Is, is uh, If there's someone in particular that you're praying for, and let's just say let's just say you're you're praying for someone and their birthday is on September 22nd. Set an alarm on your phone to go off every single day at 9:22 September 22nd. And that way you remember at 9:22 to pray for that individual. You pray for them every day. I have that in my phone for a certain family member at the same time every day my phone goes off and reminds me to pray for them. Tim Harlow in our series and challenges us to set our alarms for for uh, 10:02, representing Luke chapter 10, verse 2, which God, or which Jesus says, "Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers." We know that in our community, that there is a harvest field that is uh, that's ripe and it's ready. But what it needs is more workers. There's no shortage of harvest. There's no shortage of crop. There's only a shortage of workers. Maybe you want to set your alarm for, for 10.02, and then you pray at 10.02 every day and that you would ask the Lord of the Harvest to send more workers. I remember when Sarah and I got married that we put sticky notes on absolutely everything, the scripture passages, the prayers, whatever it may be. We had sticky notes on our fridge. We had sticky notes on our mirror. We had sticky notes on our car, on our phone. We had them everywhere to remind us to pray. Maybe you just simply need to develop a prayer partner, somebody that, uh, uh, someone that's just going to, to remind you every day, or maybe you're going to share requests with each other. I don't know what it is, but there are a lot of little tools that can help you begin to develop a habit of prayer, a habit of remaining attached to the vine. I've, uh, I've read a lot of books, and I, I've talked to different church leaders and church consultants, and there's one book that I that I I found that they found something that was consistent amongst amongst what's called successful churches. In other words, churches that are reaching people for Jesus. <laughs> it says successful churches are praying churches. Should seem like an obvious conclusion, but perhaps it's not obvious. Perhaps we need to be reminded of that. I also don't think it's any accident that successful churches are praying churches. Because praying churches are relying on the power of God. Here's kind of a soul-searching quote, one more quote from Jim Simula, one that really that kind of cut me to the heart. Jim Simula said this, Pastors and churches have to get uncomfortable enough to say, we are not New Testament Christians if we don't have a prayer life. We have to get uncomfortable enough to make that statement. We are not New Testament Christians if we don't have a prayer life. Now, this past week, in the way that we ended our service, or ended the sermon time, we, we ended it with about 10 minutes of prayer. Uh, right there within the room. We had people around the room. We had people sitting in the seats. But we had a room that was filled with prayer. Because this is something that we can do right here, right now. As soon as this, this, this video is over, maybe that's what you need to do. Is you just need to take some time, 5, 10, 30, 60. I don't know how long, how many minutes you need to spend in prayer. But maybe as soon as we... I uh, get done with this. You just need to spend some time in prayer. Here are a few suggestions as to what you can pray for. How about the Colossians 4 prayer? That you pray that God would give you opportunities and that he would give you the words to speak to those that don't know Jesus. Or the Philippians 4 prayer. Maybe you have something that's causing you a great amount of anxiety. 
And you just need to spend some time in prayer about that. You need to lift those things up to God because he cares for you. Maybe you just want to spend some time with the Luke 10 prayer that God would raise up some more, more workers for this harvest field. Or how about Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, where, where Jesus says, hey, Wait here in Jerusalem. You're going to be my witnesses. I'm going to send you the power, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Maybe you need to pray the Jerusalem prayer. That God would place somebody in your Jerusalem. Or maybe he already has placed someone in your Jerusalem, right where you're at, that you need to pray for. Maybe you need to spend some time praying for a specific name. Or the ends of the earth prayer. We've got missionaries overseas and other countries, some of them dangerous, some of them not as dangerous, but regardless, they're there preaching the gospel, telling others about Jesus. Spend some time praying for them. Or last, maybe you've been involved all the way throughout this series, and you have a decision that you need to make. I, I don't know if that's a decision to follow Jesus for the first time and, and to enter into a, a time where you repent of your sin, you place your faith in Jesus, and you're baptized. Maybe that's the decision that you need to make. Call the church office, talk to me on Sunday, talk to an elder, talk to somebody near you about what it means to begin to follow Jesus. Uh, maybe you've just been uh, wrestling with joining a life group. Uh, I don't know what, what it is that you're wrestling with. Uh, maybe you just need to begin to share with somebody uh, within your Jerusalem. I don't know what decision you've been wrestling with, but you probably do. Maybe you just need to begin to pray about that decision that God would give the courage and the boldness and that then you would follow up with that follow up with that decision. There are so many different things that we could pray for, and I just pray that you would uh, that you would just see the power and the impact that prayer can make when we open up our lives to God's work within our lives, when we remain attached to that vine, and we rely on God to produce fruit through our lives, that we would be a church, that you would be a person that is committed to living like Jesus to fulfill the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching, everything that he has commanded, that you would go out and be a witness and tell people about your story, tell them about what Jesus has done in history and what he is going to do in all of eternity. I'd just like to take some time to pray for you about that now. As soon as we hang up, if you need to spend some more time in prayer, I hope that you will do that. Father God, you are good. God, we just thank you for the way that you work, that you didn't leave us on our own, but you actually placed us within a church family, that we could just be real with one another, that we could share with one another, that we could be encouraged by one another. But God, that you also filled us with your spirit, that you give us the power to do things that we can't do on our own. Because God, you want to do so much more in our lives than we could even imagine. God, I just pray that we would just be open to you, that we would remain attached to you and allow you to produce fruit within our lives. But help us to be a church. Help us to be people that are committed to living a life on mission. I pray all this in your son's name.